Hello everybody, back in August, several of us took a cruise together on the Aegean Sea throughout the Greek world of the Apostle Paul. The tour, in fact, was called the Footsteps of Paul the Apostle. And on that cruise, I gave a series of teachings, one of which I was requested by several of you to make a video repeating or revisiting the teaching is uh, the conditions on the boat that they were windy or some of you didn't take notes and therefore I'm keeping my promise to revisit the topic and the topic is or the very title of the video is the Jews of the Gospels versus the Jews of Paul's letters. I felt that as we were traveling the Greek world together, it was important for me to delineate the difference between the Jews that Jesus encountered in Judea versus the Jews that Paul encountered on his journeys throughout the Greek world of his day. Now, when you read the Gospels, we hear repeatedly, almost to the point of it becoming rhythmically, the Jews referred to by the groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the teachers of the law. And these groups are mentioned often. They're central to the gospel narrative for they comprise the chief opposition to Jesus, particularly the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it's repeated over and over again. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, as I said, almost rhythmically. The problem is, is when we move to the letters of Paul, we're never really told outright who are those Jews. Now, I'm telling you that those Jews were very different from the Jews of Judea. You may recall in the Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy lands in Oz, she looks down at Toto and she says, Toto, we're no longer in Kansas. Well, even though such a line doesn't exist in any of Paul's letters, that truth is very much the same, that when the gospel moved to the larger Greco-Roman world, the world was very different. Even its Jewish component was very different from that of the four gospels. So the subject I wanted to cover on the cruise were who are these Jews that Paul encountered in places like we were going to, such as Ephesus, such as Pergamum, uh, how are they different than the ones that Jesus encountered? To begin that story, we have to begin actually with two Gentiles from the 4th century BC, they being Socrates and Plato. The former Socrates being the master or teacher of the latter Plato. Now, Socrates never left for us any writings. He didn't believe actually in writing. I'm not saying that he wasn't literate or capable of writing, but he was of the belief that writing at the time was of little value, that it was more important to repeatedly speak the truth that one wanted to convey rather than write it down, for the belief was that if you write it down, it won't be remembered. It was a oral culture and uh and therefore, the emphasis was on uh, speaking as opposed to writing. But Socrates' student, Plato, would write his teacher's uh, doctrines or philosophy in his own books, which were cast as dialogues, the most famous of which was known as Plato's Republic, written sometime around 375 B.C., and this is Plato's most famous work, and it had and still has an incredible influence on Western thinking, perhaps one of the most important books ever written in the Western tradition. And in this book, The Republic, Plato cast a cast of characters, including his teacher Socrates, as convening or meeting together in Piraeus, the ancient port of Athens. And for those of us that were on the cruise together, we actually boarded and disembarked our clipper ship in that same port, Piraeus. It exists to this day. Well, Plato has these characters sitting together. It begins in the courtyard of one of the characters in Piraeus, and they pursue the subject of justice, both as an abstract principle, as well as 
what would constitute a just soul, a just individual human being. And this is a very long work, The Republic, and uh, several chapters into the book, Socrates is quoted basically as saying, look, this is an abstract, difficult subject. Why don't we make it easier by reducing it to a microcosm? That is, let's switch topics to trying to come up with what a just city would look like. For the world of Plato and Socrates was a world of city-states. They weren't nations like we know today. They weren't nation-states like France or Italy or England, but rather city-states. A city in the singular in Greek is called polis, P-O-L-I-S. So, for instance, Indianapolis in modern-day America would mean the city of the Indians. And in plural, it would be poles, P-O-L-E-I-S. And Plato's Socrates uh, character, a real person, as I said, but he's cast here as a character, suggests that let's try to come up or, or work out together through a dialogue. What would make a just ideal city and perhaps when we arrive to that conclusion we can use that city as a paradigm for something more abstract which is what is justice for the human soul now in a sense therefore this whole pursuit of a just city is in itself a metaphor for the larger principle of what justice is in general now when the book the republic gets to the seventh chapter or seventh of, uh, let's say they it, it calls itself books within the book. So the Republic is comprised of 10 books. Book seven is famous because within it, Socrates launches into one of the most famous, in my opinion, the most famous allegory in the Western heritage called the allegory of the cave, wherein he, he asks one of his fellow uh, characters, a guy by the name of Glaucon, who's the real life brother of Plato, he says to Glaucon, I want you to imagine a cave. And in that cave are a group of men who from their birth have been restrained I, in something likened to uh, the stockade, okay, to stocks. In other words, these men have been affixed in a position in which they're only able to sit looking forward at the wall of the cave. Their heads and legs are affixed in such a way so that they're not able to turn and look at each other or see anywhere other than the front wall of the cave. And Socrates says that behind these men is a fire that's burning 24-7, 24 hours, seven days a week. And there are men walking before that fire, which is behind these prisoners in the cave, who are walking with cut out silhouettes of real things such as birds, such as dogs, uh, such as trees. I would liken it to when we were kids and we would be sitting in class and the teacher would begin uh, some, a movie or have their overhead projector on and one of the kids in the class would start to go like this with their fingers before the projector in order to cast what looks like a dog on the movie screen or on the wall of the classroom. We've all seen this before as kids, so hopefully you can all relate to that. So in other words, Socrates says to Glaucon, Glaucon, I want you to imagine that on the wall before these prisoners whose heads are fixed in such a way that they can't look behind them and see what the origin of the light or these shadows are. Behind them is this fire in which men are carrying cutouts of dogs, of birds and animals. And throughout their childhood and maturity into adulthood, the prisoners in this cave only know these shadows of these silhouette cutouts of real objects. And for them, that's the only reality that they know. But one day, one of the prisoners escapes from this stockade type contraption, these stocks, and begins to wander towards the opening of the cave. But the light of the sun is so bright that he turns back. He uh, turns back to go back to his previous captivity, but he's forcibly dragged out of the cave where 
as he emerges into the bright sun, he goes blind for several minutes. He can't see anything and it takes a while for his eyes to adjust. And so slowly do his eyes adjust that he's only able to see uh, the shadows of things outside. And as his, his eyes adjust even more, he begins to be able to see the reflections of reality. In other words, he's able to see in pools of water and ponds, the reflections of real life objects like trees and, and animals and, and birds as reflections in the water. And as his eyes adjust even more, he's unable to cast his gaze on these real objects, on real trees, on real people, not just their reflections in lakes. And then ultimately, after much time of his eyes adjusting to the sunlight, he then is able to cast his gaze at the sun itself to see that the ultimate reality is that the sun is what's giving uh, light and life to the objects that he's now able to see outside, but that his former inmates in the cave, they're only able to see the shadows of cut out silhouettes of these objects. They're not able to see even the beginning of the reality for the only reality these people know are the shadows of silhouettes, man-made silhouette cutouts. Remember the kid in the classroom uh, representing the realities that the escaped prisoner has now been able to see with his naked eye. Well, in his excitement and zeal for the truth, the prisoner who escaped and was forced out into the light of truth, runs back into the cave and he tries to enlighten and awaken his former fellow captives to the truth that guys, what you're looking at on the wall, the cave is nothing but shadows. You've got to see the reality for what it is. You got to come out of the cave into the light of truth and see the true objects that throughout your entire life, you've only seen the shadows of. Well, they think that this guy is crazy. In fact, when he comes back into the cave to communicate to them, he has spent so much time in the light that he's almost not able to readjust to the darkness, okay? And we can all relate to that. When somebody comes in from the bright sun into a darkened room, they can barely see anything. Yet somebody who's been sitting in the dark for hours uh, is able to see at least some basic objects in the dark. Just like he became adjusted to the light, they are adjusted to the dark. That's what they're used to. So in his zeal, he's trying to get them to come out and join the light of reality that he's partaked in for the last several hours. But in their being used to the dark, they refuse to do so. And in fact, they're so militantly opposed to his invitation to come to the light to his zeal that they try to kill this messenger of truth who Socrates likens to a philosopher. Philosophy in Greek means the love of wisdom. A philosopher, if you reduce it to the most basic uh, meaning of the word, is somebody who loves wisdom or pursues truth at all costs. A truth lover is a philosopher. And Socrates and Plato uses this allegory called the allegory of the cave to communicate, which would become known later in Western thought as the theory of forms, that everything that we see here in this world, they're nothing but shadows of greater truths. Now, Steve, what does this have to do with the Jews of Paul? Well, much in every way. Why? Because the Jews that Paul encounters had been living in the Greek world for a couple hundred years by the time that Paul encounters them. Just like Jews in America have been living here for over 120 years in some cases. My own family came here from Austria in the 1890s or 1880s, and therefore one could presume that that my family, leading up to yours truly, assimilated the American way of life and the American worldview into our, our very being. In other words, an American Jew is 
like an American Protestant or an American Catholic or an Italian American or a Polish American, they're American. They've assimilated American values. Well, similarly, the Jews of Paul's day had assimilated in many ways that Greek form of thought that we refer to as Hellenism, Hellas being the Greek word for the country, Greece. Okay, The Greeks don't call their country Greece. They call it by the name of Hellas. Hellenism referring to the larger mindset and culture of the ancient Greeks. And therefore, the Jews of Paul's day, we refer to as Hellenistic Jews. They had imbibed that larger Greek world around them, including some of its philosophy, including the theory of forms. They would have been familiar with it, and if they weren't familiar with it by name, it was a large enough presence in their world that they'd imbibed it in their way of thinking. And we see it in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Okay, and I'm going to read to you the first verses from uh, chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews to show this, what I'm trying to communicate, which is that the, the Greek Jews of Paul's day were Greek as much as they were Jews. For even though the name of the book is called Hebrews, it was written in Greek to Jews living in the Greek diaspora. In other words, Although called Hebrews, it's written to the Jews of the Greek world. Now, we don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews, and it's disputed. Most scholars today don't believe Paul himself wrote the book of Hebrews, but probably one of his disciples or someone belonging to his school, somebody who was influenced by Paul's teachings, someone who may have traveled with Paul along his missionary journeys, but at the least were influenced by his uh, teaching and way of thinking. So as we go to the Pauline authored, Pauline as in not necessarily Paul, but uh, one of uh, somebody belonging to the school of Paul or to one of Paul's own students, we go to the Pauline book of Hebrews to see this theory of forms which becomes uh, repeated in many ways throughout Paul's letters and or, or the Pauline corpus of the New Testament to see this theory of forms from the allegory of the cave in play or at work here. So, and it comes across here in the very first lines of Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law or Torah has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. And then I said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So here in the book of Hebrews, written to a Greek speaking um, Jews for whom their mother tongue is Greek and their culture is the surrounding Greek culture, Paul saying that the Torah and the temple institution with its sacrifices and various elements of worship is these things are nothing but shadows of a higher reality. They're not the end unto themselves, but a means to the end, a means to show a reality that transcends these very things. Now, elsewhere in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, Paul likens the Torah and Moses to a pedagogue, a pedagogue or tutor. It's usually translated as tutor in English, but the underlying Greek word is pedagogue. The pedagogue in ancient Greece was a slave whose job was to convey his master's uh, children to school to make sure they got to school safely and then 
dutifully listened in class. His job was to discipline the kids if they weren't paying attention in class. And Paul saying that the Torah, and you could say the Torah and the temple and everything else related to it were the pedagogue or tutor whose job was to accompany the Jewish people to school until they completed their lessons, after which their lessons were to lead them to the conclusion or to the greater truth. What's the greater truth that Paul's trying to communicate here in his writings that Jesus and the Gospels are that transcendent truth that the Torah and the prophets and the temple were pointing to. And now that Jesus and the Gospels have come, there's no need anymore for this pedagogue or tutor. And therefore, you see what started with Plato in the 4th century BC is the theory of forms, makes it into the New Testament books of Hebrews and Galatians because the Jews of Paul's day are not the Jews of Judea. They are the Jews of the Greco-Roman world who have been touched and influenced by Greek thinking. And Paul is speaking to them in that culture for, as you know, Paul was a product both of Judea as a Pharisee, but also of the Greco-Roman world into which he was born and raised in the city of Tarsus. He's able to communicate to both worlds, to be all things to all peoples, to be a Judean Jew to the Judean Jews, and to be a Hellenistic Jew to the Hellenistic Jews of Greece. And here we've seen in this lesson not only how the Jews of Greece were influenced by Greek philosophers, but how Paul is able to use Greek philosophy in such a way that I'll conclude by saying that as God used Moses and the prophets as the tutor to lead the Judean Jews to this higher truth of Jesus being the Messiah, one could argue that God used the Greek philosophers as the pedagogue or tutor to lead both the Greek Gentiles who would read Paul's letters and the Greek Jews to whom the letter of Hebrews was written to as pedagogues in a manner after Moses. In other words, Moses is a pedagogue to the Jews, but Plato and Socrates, God used to prepare the Greek Gentiles and Greek Jews to reveal this higher truth that Jesus and the gospel are that transcendent truth that all the things that came before it, including things in our everyday uh, world, okay, are simply the shadows of, but not the ultimate truth themselves. Anyway, that, my friends, is the difference between the Jews of Judea and the Jews of Paul, and I gave this teaching on the boat, and I was asked to repeat it as a video, uh, and I hope that somehow I was able to make this uh, digestible and relevant uh, to your study of the scriptures, to your study of the context of these scriptures, and in the study of the world in which they were written, the world and the times. Anyway, this is Steve, the tour guide. I've tried to make something that is complex, into a simple digestible lesson let me know in the comments section if i succeeded to do so and leave me any questions if there's anything that i've left remaining in your mind that is not clear after reviewing this lesson that i gave on the boat anyway this is steve the tour guide signing off and wishing you a phenomenal day bye bye